Well, good morning to each one of you. And I may be saying good morning again because I'm not sure how I'm going to work on putting all this together later. But we're going to start our service just a little different today. The name of our service is, did the preacher really say that? And, well, sometimes preachers say a lot of things, don't they? But before they do that, and before this one does it, I've got something I want to share with you. And I have to do this in such a way that the people online can see what I want to do at the same time. And I didn't really figure out a good way to do that, except by doing it like this. So what I have here on the front here is a, a video I want you to watch. A video I want you to watch. And it's about two and a half minutes. And I'll try to narrate this a little bit for those who can't see it, the folks on the phone and for Brother Don. Um, but all of these videos, you're going to see several short videos, and they all have something in common. And I want you to be trying to think what they have in common. So um, hopefully this will work. We're going to try it now. I'm just going to pause before I show you the final piece of video. And if you know the secret, don't say it if you know the secret. I mean, if you've seen this before, don't say it. But does anyone know what all these things have in common? Well, for one thing, they're all in color. They're all in color. That's that. Yes, they are. They're very colorful. That's right. Looking at structure. Looking at structure. Organization. Organization. Okay. Well, I'm going to show you the last one now. Mastodons walking through the snow and breathing steam. Now, we've just shown a video of some very interesting things. Some drone shots, some animal life, human interest things. But there's something about that last picture that you know is not real. Yeah. Right? So everything that you just saw was created using artificial intelligence. None of it exists in reality. Now, there are real places like Big Sur and so on, but the pictures you saw were created totally by a computer. I'm AI, artificial intelligence, and, and this is a step beyond CGI, which we've had for the last 50 years plus or so. The reason that I showed you this is I want you to understand how you cannot trust your eyes. You cannot trust your eyes today. In a photograph, a video, anything that you see. Because Satan has long worked 
through deception in various channels, and his first success in the earth came upon the sense of sight. If you turn with me to Genesis chapter 3 and verses 1 through 3, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye, what? Die. Verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And now notice this part in verse 6. And when the woman saw, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to what? The eyes. The eyes. And a tree to be, des to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. The sense of visual acuity was very prominent in this deception. Don't forget that. When God instructed Moses to go before Pharaoh and to say, let my people go, he said, I'm going to give you some things to do that will be miraculous, and it will be something to help convince Pharaoh that I have sent you. And if we turn to Exodus chapter 7, and verses 9 through 12, we see why God did this. Exodus 7, verse 9, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Shew a miracle for you. Now, as you read on later, Pharaoh isn't recorded as saying that, but he must have said it, because God knew he was going to say it. And he said, you know, he's going to ask you to show a miracle. He wants to see something. It says, Then shalt thou say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt. They did also in like manner with their enchantments. Now, notice that they wanted to see a miracle. Now, of course, if we read on, we realize that the Lord's um, serpents ate up right. the ones from Egypt. But it was based on something that they could see. And in the last great deception, Satan will use the sense of sight to deceive many. In Revelation chapter 13, going to the Apocalypse, chapter 13, we're starting verse 11. And John says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell thereon to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And then in verse 13, And he doth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do. And those miracles were to bring fire down in the sight of men. He had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. What sense is this going to appeal to? The sense of sight, isn't it? But God has a different plan for his people. God has a different plan. And Don, this is a good one for you because you get this as well as we do. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, the Bible says, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. What we have to trust in these last days, friends, is the word of God alone. And God has given us, in addition, as a people, His Word. He has given us His testimonies to help us, to guide us in the study of that Word and to understand it. Now, the title of the sermon, again, is, Did the Preacher Really Say That? 
And as church members, we hear many things spoken from the pulpits and with today's Media Illustrated um, ways, we, we see great productions and sometimes it's built into an extravaganza. The people are bewildered and even hypnotized through mind control techniques. But I don't believe, friends, we have to be victims of these things. Now, we believe it's very important to understand who God is. There seems to be, according to the Bible, as I understand it at least, nothing more foundational than to know God and to want to serve Him, to have His character. And there's going to be some tests given in the last days, things that we're going to be tested upon. And it's vital for us to understand the truths that these tests are going to be based upon and to understand the, 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 that the concept of any test has a purpose. Now, we know that one of the great tests in the last days is going to be on the Sabbath. Amen? Yes. And sometimes people ask me, they say, you know, Brother Allen, why do you make it such an issue about really understanding and knowing God when the Sabbath is a test? But what is the Sabbath a test on, friends? It's going to be a test on whether we know who God is and are willing to serve Him according to His Word and not our own ways. Yesterday, I, I picked up a couple hitchhikers and, and uh, we, we were talking a little bit about the Lord. And, and just as we were finishing, this one man said, well, what church do you go to on Sunday? And I said, I don't go to any church on Sunday. I attend on Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, because the Bible says the seventh day is the Sabbath. He said, oh, yeah. He says, you know, he says, they did find out that's right. Some people did some research and they found out that was right. But, you know, it really doesn't matter as long as you go to church, right? I said, well, what really matters is to do what God says, to do what God says. So we're going to have some tests in the book, Great Controversy, on page 588 in paragraph one. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, mm -hmm. Satan will bring people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with who? Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hands of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. And if you really can't see this in the making right now in our political system, you're not paying much attention to what's going on. There's a certain faction of government that is taking certain control and with, um, with the high probability that Donald Trump is going to be reelected president. You can see that these people have uh, a, a, an agenda and it's a strong agenda they have. Now, I want to talk a little bit about these two errors. And the first is the error of the immortality of the soul. This is something that the Catholics and the majority of the Protestant world, as well as, well as many of the, the, the pagans, believe in. They teach that the soul is naturally immortal. And you know, the preacher says so. So it must be true, right? The preacher says so. It must be true. But I want to give you a list of the verses here on, my, on the screen that teach the soul is naturally immortal. Well, there's a list of zero here. There's no scriptures anywhere that teach that the soul is naturally immortal. But the soul being immortal, if that's true, immortal means not subject to death. That means that the soul cannot die. The soul is not subject to death. But in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4, Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4, he says, Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, it doesn't say just the body dies and the soul lives on, does it? It says the soul will die. And a little bit later in that same chapter, in verse 20, if you drop down to just verse 20, he says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wickedness shall be upon him. And the soul that sinneth, it shall die. So it would seem from these verses that man is indeed not immortal. He is rather mortal. He is indeed subject to death. 
And uh, in Job chapter 4 and verse 17, the question is asked, shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall man be more pure than his maker? Man is described as a mortal being in the Bible. Now, tradition, and we'll see this in a little bit, tradition teaches otherwise. But friends, are we going to go by tradition or are we going to go by the Word of God? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing what? The Word of God. It was because God was not going to allow man to become an immortal sinner that he drove Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. Going back to Genesis chapter 3 and verses 22 and 23, it says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and what? Live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. The tree of life had properties that could perpetuate life. You know, we all eat food today that perpetuates our life to a certain extent, keeps us going day by day. But it doesn't keep us from getting old. It doesn't keep us from deteriorating and dying. But there was something about the tree of life that could do that. And if Adam and Eve were to eat of that, it would perpetuate them. They weren't naturally immortal. They had to eat of that to stay immortal, if you please. But when they quit eating of that, they became subject to death. And so it's important for us to understand the principle, first and foremost, that we are not an immortal being naturally, and then to understand what that means in relationship to when a person dies, the state of death. Because spiritualism tries to teach that when you are dead, you really are not dead. You simply move into a higher state of existence where you can communicate with people in various parts of the world and in various ways. But the Bible says, and again, it's not important what the preacher says. It's only important what the Bible says. And to take that a step further, it's not important what I tell you today. What I tell you is not important. But what inspiration tells you, that's what's important. Okay? And Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 5, he says, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead, they know everything going on. No, the dead know not anything, neither have they any more a reward for the memory of them is what? Forgotten. The dead know not anything. Another verse in Psalms 146 and verse 4. Speaking of someone who has died, it says, His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, and that very day his thoughts what? They don't become enlightened. They don't have extra knowledge. His thoughts perish. They just ceased to exist, if you please. This is sort of a reverse of Genesis 2, 7. Remember, God took the dust of the ground, he formed man, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. And here it says the breath goes forth, and there's not into him, but away from him. He returns to the earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. In 1517, Martin Luther posted his famous 95 thesis regarding errors of the Catholic Church. But in defending Many of these errors later, in 1520, he listed the idea, quote, that the soul is immortal, end quote, as, quote, all, the, all these endless monstrosities in the Roman dunghill of the credos, end quote. Luther was really obsessed with this in the sense that he was against purgatory. And he says, if the soul ceases to exist, if the person is in sleep, as you please, in death, because he believed in a resurrection, obviously. You know, he knew enough about the Bible to get that one right, for sure. Um, he said, you know, you can't have purgatory if people are unconscious in death. Now, even though Luther said it, that doesn't make it true of itself, does it? But I'm just illustrating that we're not alone in understanding this. In fact, William Tyndale had some very strong debates with Thomas More and others about this very issue. And so, the Bible says in John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not, what? Perish, but have everlasting life. So, there's two things contrasted, aren't there? Everlasting life is contrast, contrasted with perishing. 
You can't have everlasting life and perish at the same time, friends. You don't get that. But did the preacher really say that? Did the preacher really say that? Well, here's a website, gotquestions.org. And it says, what does it mean that hell is eternal separation from God? And it says, the Bible is clear that there are two possible designations for every human soul following physical death. Now, notice they use the term physical death. Heaven or hell. And they give some references. Only the righteous inherit eternal life. But later on down, it says, death means everlasting punishment. This place of punishment is eternal. So what they're saying about hell is hell is eternal separation from God in punishment. Now, I would agree that hell will result. Listen to me carefully. Hell will result in eternal separation from God because you're not even going to be around. You'll be separated and it'll be eternal, but it, you're not going to be alive and you're not going to be burning forever in hell. Here's another website, Compelling Truth. Wow, what a name, Compelling Truth. That must be a good one. Is hell eternal separation from God? It is evident that there are two location options for human souls to go after death, heaven or hell. And, and they'll be glad to tell you that they both are there for eternity, for eternity. Both are eternal, eternal life, aren't they? Yeah, they are both eternal life, aren't they? It's just a different kind of life. One's good, one's great, but the other's bad. It's like people who are in, in the supermax today out in Colorado. They, they have a pretty, pretty bad life out there. But it's life. Not great life, not good life, but it's life. Now, in 2 Thessalonians 1 9, the Bible says, Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power? Uh, also, Jesus said, You know, some will depart. You know, he says, Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Of course, there is going to be a separation, and it is going to be eternal, but it's not an eternal separation with a knowledge of consciousness and burning in fire forever and ever. In that same epistle in chapter 2 and verse 8, he says, Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. It doesn't sound like they're living on forever and ever in glory or in hell either one, the wicked. In verse 10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be what? Saved. Saved. In them that perish. Perish. There certainly will be a separation again, and it certainly will be eternal, but not with life. Did the preacher really say that Sunday is the Sabbath? Sunday is the Lord's Day? Sunday is to replace the Sabbath. You know, you hear those things, and I wonder, did the preacher really say that because the Bible doesn't? Let me give you a list of the texts that say that the Lord's Day is Sunday. And here's a list of the texts that says Sunday is the Sabbath. Well, it's zero, isn't it? There's no such text anywhere. It's important to know that. And it's important to know this because the last great text test will appear upon the Sabbath truth. Now, the Bible says... Again, it's what important what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. We have here the Sabbath commandment. And it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the what? The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It doesn't say it's the Sabbath of the Jews. It doesn't say it's the Sabbath of the Seventh-day Adventists. People say to me, oh, you know, your, your Sabbath is Saturday. No, no. It's the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy strangers within thy gates. And then he gives the rationale for it in verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven, earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Of the very few things that God ever spoke audibly, openly to humanity, Certainly the Ten Commandments is the most voluminous thing that he's ever said, that has ever come from his lips, right? We all agree on that. I don't think there's any question on that. But notice what he says in Psalms 89 and verse 34. Psalms 89 and verse 34. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. <laughs> he spoke those Ten Commandments, friends. He says he's not going to alter the thing that came out of his lips. He says that the Sabbath which is the seventh day, is his holy day. 
in Isaiah chapter 58 and verses 13 and 14. He says, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and instead you call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thy own pleasure, nor speaking thine words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. In other words, when we focus on God instead of ourselves and our worldliness on the Sabbath, he says, then we are going to have a delight in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. The Sabbath is an important issue. And we hear all this stuff about the Lord's Day, the Lord's Day Alliance, the movement to restore the Lord's Day. But you know, the Bible does speak about the Lord's Day in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. John says, I was in the spirit on what? The Lord's Day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. What day was this? Do we have any inspired statements to, to show this? Well, we just read from Isaiah that he says the Sabbath is his holy day. That would be the Lord's Day for sure. But in addition to that, I'd just like to submit to you the book Acts of the Apostles on page 581 in paragraph 4. And there we are told very plainly, it was on the Sabbath that the Lord of glory appeared to the exile apostle. The Sabbath was as sacredly observed by John on Patmos as when he was preaching to the people in the towns and cities of Judea. He claimed as his own the precious promises that had been given regarding that day. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Amen. That's the Sabbath, friends. Amen. I'm all for the Lord's day. Amen. As long as it's the biblical Lord's day. Amen. Amen. Now, have any of you ever seen this book entitled From Sabbath to Sunday? Uh, a Historical Inves Investigation of the Rise of Sunday Observance in the Early Christian Church by Samuel Bakayoki. Some of you ever seen this book? I've seen, I've seen pictures of it. You've seen pictures of it? Have you all ever seen this book before? Have you heard about it a little bit? You know a little bit about it? If you look at the bottom of the book, it has uh, what is called an imp imprimatur from the Pontifical Gregorian University Press of Rome in 1977. And what that means is that it has the seal from that university that it teaches official Catholic doctrine. You say, well, who was this Catholic Bakayoki? Well, no, he wasn't supposedly a Catholic. He was a Seventh-day Adventist who went to this school, and I'll tell you more about that school in a minute, and got his PhD, his doctorate there, and this is his thesis. On the inside of the book, it shows you uh, about that he got the imprimatur from the rector of the university and uh, gives a little bit of information on it. In his acknowledgement, which, by the way, in, in the Internet edition has been taken out, in the acknowledgement, he says, and I'll zoom in a little bit here for you, I might mention that in a few places my interpretation of certain biblical texts such as Revelation 1.10 and Colossians 2.14 through 17 and of historical data differs somewhat from the traditional position of my church. Of course, he claims to be a son of Davis. Now, the traditional position of his church in Revelation 1.10 is that the seventh day is what? The Sabbath. But he says, no, it wasn't the Sabbath at all. Now, it's interesting, in this copy that I have, which is, uh, I think, a second printing, second edition, it says somewhat, it differs somewhat. But in his original Acknowledgement. It said differs radically. Differs radically. But the text of the book didn't change. But he changed it to say from radically to somewhat to make it a little more palatable. This book, I, I was surprised when I first got a copy of this book because I heard how great this book was. This book is going to help us. This book really, you know, tells the Sabbath truth and and this is a great book. And I look in the back and I see these acknowledgments in the back. And I, I'll just zoom in on a couple of them here. And these acknowledgments are all from Sunday Keepers telling how great this book is. And I'm thinking, now, why would Sunday Keepers be so high and so happy about a book that really should be turning their religion on its end? But apparently doesn't. And it's because this book was written in doublespeak. This book was written in doublespeak. Mm -hmm. If you are a Sabbatarian Adventist and you read it, you're going to think, oh, this guy's got, the, got, the, got a handle on things. It's good. 
But if you're a Sunday keeper and that's what your mindset is, you're going to read this book and you're thinking he's defending Sunday keeping. And the fact that he has the backing of, of, of these Catholics, and let me just go back if I can. Um, do you see the initials at the end of the, of the names on this? And do you know what that means? It means Society of Jesus. And what is a more common name for the Society of Jesus in the Catholic Church? The Jesuits. In other words, this is a Jesuit school. It's a place that they only allow their best and brightest to go to. And yet they allowed this Protestant to come there, this, quote, estranged brother. Why did they do that? And why did he go? Friends, this man, as soon as he graduated, was hired to teach at Andrews University. And so he came and started to teach the, 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 the new preachers going out the things that he believed and had learned. I'm going to tell you, friends, we have to understand the truth about the Sabbath and not be confused by theological rhetoric. Theological rhetoric. Now I'll ask you a question. What day, what day of the week do you think Satan is going to make fire come down from heaven Sunday. inside of man? Sunday. I think it's going to come on Sunday. What day do you think Satan will impersonate Christ? Yeah. I think it's going to be on Sunday. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, friends, we, we have an obligation to know for ourselves what is truth and then to be able to share that truth with others as we are told that we should be able to give an answer to every man that asketh a reason for the faith that is within us with meekness and fear. Amen? Now, those are two things that are very important for us to understand. But... This is part one. Now I've got part two. Now we are, we're 10 till, but I think that we have enough time to go into part two today, don't you? Shouldn't we go ahead into part two while we're here? Sure. Because the preachers say things about the Bible, but there are preachers who say things about the testimonies too. And I think there's a, a few categories that we need to look at very carefully. And so I want to look at a few thoughts about statements from the testimonies. And did the preacher really say that? For instance, we must not be shaken out of the church, or those shaken are shaken out of the church. How many times did Ellen White make those statements? You know, it's interesting. She spoke a lot about the shaking. But never, never did she say that we must not be shaken out of the church or that the shaken are shaken out of the church. That's not what she said. So let's find out what she did say, because that's what's important. It doesn't matter what I say. Okay. Don't have to go here and quoting me for anything today. Just quote the testimonies, quote the scriptures. Fair. This is from early writings, page 50, paragraph three, the mighty shaking has commenced. Ah, it's already begun. She says, and will go on until all will be shaken out who are not willing to take a bold and unyielding stand for the Truth. truth, and to sacrifice for God and his cause. The angel said, think ye that any will be compelled to sacrifice. No, no. It must be a free will offering. It will take all to buy the field. I cried to God to spare his people, some of whom were fainting and dying. Now I'll ask you a question. When was this written? When was this written? Early, in her life. early, well, early writings is early, right? According to the White Estate, Early Writings is a comprehensive selection of Ellen G. White's published writings from the 1850s. From the 1850s. And I will give you the exact location. It comes from the present truth of April 1, 1850, in an article to the Little Falk on paragraph 9. And there you will find, word for word, what we just read, except the punctuation has been, uh, uh, in Early Writings, was, was updated and corrected. She says, the mighty shaking has commenced and will go on and all will be shaken out who are not willing to take a bold and unyielding stand for the truth and sacrifice for God and his cause. Now I want to ask you a question. When did the church denomination begin? Organized church. The organized church, 1863. This was written in 1850, 13 years before. She couldn't have been saying they're going to be shaken out of the church because the church hadn't been founded yet as such. But what is the context? The context. 
The context, and remind you, context is king. Amen. The context is that they're going to be shaken out of the truth. Mm -hmm. They're shaken out of the truth. And one of the reasons also is that because they would not sacrifice for God and his cause. That's not all. How about this statement? And this is from a review and herald of December 31, 1857, paragraph 1. She says, November 20th, so just the month before, I was shown the people of God and saw them mightily shaken. But again, there's no denominated church form yet. Certainly there, there's groups. Certainly there is a, 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 an invisible church, if you please. But she says, notice this. I saw some with strong faith and agonizing cries pleading with God. Their countenances were pale and marked with deep anxiety, which expressed their internal struggle. There was firmness and great earnestness expressed in their countenances, while large drops of perspiration rose upon their foreheads and fell. Now and then their faces would light up with the marks of God's approbation. And again, the same solemn, earnest, anxious look settled upon them. They were concerned about their experience. They were concerned about whether they were living in the truth or not. And again, the date is when? 1857. Continuing in that same article, a few paragraphs down. The numbers of this company had lessened. Some had been shaken out and left by the way. They were shaken out of the company. But this was a company of people who believed truth. The careless and indifferent who did not join with those who prized victory and salvation enough to agonize, persevere, and plead for it did not obtain it, and they were left behind in darkness, and their numbers were immediately made up by others taking hold of the church, joining the church, taking hold of the truth and coming into the ranks. Still the evil angels pressed around them, but they could have no power over them. Friends, she says that if we are careless, if we are indifferent, if we do not prize the victory. It used to be Seventh-day Adventists stood apart from every church in the world because of our teaching of the investigative judgment and the sanctuary doctrine that God was going to perfect a people in the end time like no other people had ever been perfected. A people who would have total victory. But today, it is so commonly taught, no, you can't overcome all sin. You're going to sin until Jesus comes. I'm going to tell you, a lot of people have been shaken out who think that they're still in. But they've been shaken out of truth. How about this idea? Have you ever heard this? The church is not Babylon. The church is not Babylon. The church is not Babylon. The church will never be Babylon. Well, there are zero statements that say those exact words. But there are some other ideas, and we're going to look at them here in just a minute. But this statement is often heard, and it's given with the solemn warning not to leave the church or you will lose salvation. Because if you're out of the church, you lose salvation. Salvation is found only in the church. Now, in one sense, that's biblical. Because if you're really in Christ, you're going to be with his people. Maybe a process of getting there. But you know, this concept in an outward form is one of the most staunch positions of the papal church. If you're out of the church, you've lost salvation. How many times have we heard people say something to the effect of, you know, Jim left the church. Sue left the church. But you never hear him say, you know, you know, John, John turned away from the Lord. He just left the church is what we hear. Because we equate that. We equate church membership with salvation, consciously or subconsciously. Well, let me show you a statement here. This is from Selected Messages, Book 2, page 68 in paragraph Three, and, and these come from testimonies that Ellen White was writing back in 1892. Again, I say, the Lord has not spoken by any messenger who calls the church that keeps the commandments of God Babylon. You see, there were people calling the Adventist church at that time Babylon, especially a couple of brethren had risen in Australia at that time. But just prior to this, Ellen White said that the Lord was pouring out the Holy Spirit. And we'll, we'll see that in a little bit. But, um, but notice that she puts a qualification on it. The church that what? Keeps the commandments of God. Friends, if a church is breaking the first commandment, are they keeping the commandments of God? 
It says, True, there are tares with wheat, but Christ said he would send his angels to first gather the tares and bind them in bundles to burn, but gather the wheat into the garner. I know that the Lord loves his church. It is not to be disorganized or broken up into independent atoms. And of course, that's true. God doesn't want that. But notice she's speaking about a church that keeps the commandments of God. So how do we understand a statement like this? There is an interpretive principle in Selected Messages, book one on page 57 and paragraph two that is vital for our understanding. This is an interpretive principle. Ellen White says regarding the testimonies, nothing is ignored, nothing is cast aside, but time and place must be considered. There was a time that Ellen White wrote against having a bicycle. You know that, don't you? about the bicycle craze and how terrible it was because people were, were, were making it a craze and they were spending extraordinary amounts of money on these bicycles for their time. And, and she said they were wasting their time and the money to do this. She also wrote something similar about automobiles at one time. But we all use automobiles today and we probably a lot of us have bicycles, right? But you look at the time and the place and what was going on. And today a bicycle can be bought cheaper than they could buy a bicycle in her day. You know, not even counting in inflation. And they can be very useful in certain things, especially in the mission fields where they can't, in some places, afford cars in places. Time and place. And she understood this and she wrote this down. Because Ellen White also wrote this. And again, you take time and place into consideration. This is in volume A of the Testimonies on page 250 in paragraph 2. And this is a statement that she wrote, it's under a section, a, a testimony section called, Shall We Be Found Wanting? Shall We Be Found Wanting? And this was written shortly after the 1903 General Conference and the debacle that they had there with the Constitution of the Church. And she says, Who can truthfully say, Our gold is tried in the fire, our garments are unspotted by the world? I saw our instructor pointing to the garments of so called righteousness, and no instructor is capital I. Stripping them off, he laid bare the defilement beneath. Then he said to me, Can you not see how they have pretentiously covered up their defilement and rottenness of character? How is the faithful city become a harlot? My father's house is made a house of merchandise, a place whence the divine presence and glory have departed. For this cause there is weakness and strength is lacking. Now, maybe two years later, four years later, ten years later, Ellen White wouldn't have said that. It depends on the time and the place. The real question is, what would she say today? What would she say today if she saw the church that was not keeping the commandments of God? If she saw a church that was doing things that I won't even speak of in the pulpit here today, supporting LGBTQ ministers in places, what would she say today about that? What do you think she'd say about that today? What would time and place dictate her pen to write? Now, Ellen White gave us a very succinct definition of Babylon in the book Great Controversy on page 381 in paragraph 1. She says the term Babylon is derived from Babel and signifies confusion. It is employed in Scripture to designate the various forms of false or apostate religion. In Revelation 17, Babylon is represented as a woman, a figure which is used in the Bible as a symbol of a church, a virtuous woman representing a pure church, a vile woman, an apostate church. Friends, we have to understand that there has been a movement, and this movement has went from, from, well, from purity first to apostasy, and then apostate. Because when someone's in apostasy, they can be brought back. They, there can be revival. There can be reformation. But once you become apostate, then you've been weighed in the balances and found lying in God's eyes. And actually, the apostles on page 11, we are told that the church is God's fortress his city of refuge, which he holds in a revolted world. Any betrayal of the church is treacherously treachery to him who has bought mankind with the blood of his only begotten son. So God considers the church pretty important, doesn't he? But then it goes on to say, from the beginning, faithful souls have constituted the church on earth. What kind of souls? Unfaithful souls? Souls that would sell us out to Rome? 
because it's a backsliding church that lessens the distance between itself and the papacy. Now I have time. I want to just talk about one more thing this morning, one more area of thought. Have you ever heard the statement, the ship is going through? Stay with the ship, right? How many times did Ellen White say the ship is going through? How many times did she say stay with the ship? She never wrote those words, ever. But certainly she must have said something about it because just like she said, you know, don't call the church keeps the commandments babbling, you know. There's those statements about the church in Babylon if we find them. And, but when we look at them, we find out there's a little more to them than beneath the surface, right? Well, here's a statement. And this is from the Review and Herald of September 20, 1892. And there's almost a similar statement in the Bible echo of that same time period that was published. And it says this, There is no need to doubt to be fearful that the work will not succeed. What won't succeed? The work. The work. God is at the head of the church. God is the head of the church. Well, he's supposed to be the head of the church, but what does she say here in the context? She says God is at the head of the work, and he will set everything in order. It matter, if matters need adjusting at the head of the work, God will attend to that and work to right every wrong. Let us have faith that God is going to carry the noble ship which bears the people of God safely into port. Amen? I believe that, don't you? I don't have any problem with this statement. But friends, we need to understand, she's speaking about the work here, and not only that, she, she says that there's the people of God. And who are those people of God? Well, we've read that it's faithful souls who constitute the church of God. The church is the pillar and ground of what? Truth. Truth. And if there's error, if there's blatant error against the Ten Commandments, it cannot be the true church. So who are the people of God? Well, let's look in the Old Testament first. In Deuteronomy 26 and verse 18. Deuteronomy 26, 18. And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his, what? Peculiar people, as he hath promised thee, and that thou shouldest keep all his, what? Commandments. He says, I want you to be my people, but I want you to keep my commandments. In Ezekiel 37 and verse 27. He says, my tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they shall be my, my people. He says, I'm going to have a people. Sure he has a people. In Jeremiah 24 and verse 7. And I will give them an heart to know me that I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God for they shall return unto me with their whole heart for or because. People serve God with their whole heart. They come to God. They keep His commandments. They're His people. The new covenant is based on this. Jeremiah 31, verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. God says His people are those who have His law written in their hearts. There was not given to Israel an unconditional promise that they were going to go through, that that ship of Israel was going to go through to the end, no matter what those people did. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14, he says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. Is there a condition here, by the way? Is there a condition? If they humble themselves, and what else? pray, and what else? And seek my face, and what else? And turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive them and will heal their land. In this text, friends, we see that God's promise to his people was on condition, and all of his promises were on conditions. They would be fulfilled if his people would humble themselves, pray, turn from their wicked ways, and follow him. The questions to really be addressed are, did the children of Israel keep their side of the covenant? Did they obey the laws of God? Did they not meet the requirements or not? Were they still his people if they didn't meet the requirements? These are very real questions and they demand answers, friends. And Jesus answered these questions in speaking to the Jewish people. In Matthew chapter 23, in verses 37 and 38, 
He said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stoneth them which are sent unto thee, how often would have I gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. When he began his mystery, ministry, he said, Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And now it's become your house. And your house is desolate. Mm. Certainly, there was no unconditional promise given to them. Now, here we are. We're living almost two millennium past the time when Jesus said, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. I think of two particular verses. I think of Hebrews 13.8. That says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. And I think of Acts chapter 10 and verse 34, where Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. When Jesus said that statement in Matthew 23, it's still true today. Because, friends, the standard that God set for his people in days of old is still the standard set today because he is the same God today that he was then. God is no respecter of persons. He had given through Daniel a prophecy that 70 weeks would be determined upon that people. 70 weeks to bring themselves into line. And if they did not come into line within that point, friends, then something was going to happen. And I would like to tell you today that God cannot do for modern Israel what he could not do for his ancient people because he does not change. There are people, and I think they are, many of them honest and sincere, who believe, based on some of the statements of Ellen White, that God is going to do something miraculous for the Seventh-day Adventist Church Corporation. I'm going to be sure I use that term corporation here so that we don't get it confused. Something for that corporation he wouldn't do for the nation of Israel. He's going to somehow preserve them and take them through to the heavenly port, no matter what they do. Friends, he does not change. But for those people, for those people who keep his commandments, for those people who have his law written in their hearts, you can be sure he's going to guide them safely into the heavenly port for sure. For sure. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You see, the people who are really the people of God are the people who follow Jesus. And if we're not following Jesus, if we're not keeping his commandments, if, our, if his law is not written in our hearts, friends, we're not his people, I'm sorry. I really am sorry. I truly mean that. That's not just rhetoric. In John chapter 14 and verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So plain, so clear, so clear. We mentioned earlier in Romans chapter 10, 17, that faith cometh by hearing and hearing what? The word of God. It doesn't matter what I tell you and it doesn't matter what any preacher says. And I don't care, you know, if, if he is a, uh, a Mark Finley, a Doug Batchelor or whoever. It could be Joel Osteen for all that matters. If the word of God doesn't substantiate it, and you know as well as I do that anyone can take one or two verses and put a certain construction on them, either out of context or without other verses, and you can say about anything you want as a preacher. But friends, we need to be students of the word, students of the word of, of God alone. I think of those people in Acts they're mentioned in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, the Bereans. And it says that these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. That is recorded by Dr. Luke, who had been traveling with Paul. And I think Paul was probably the last person they were doing this. Paul was preaching to these people, preaching to them about Jesus. But he was preaching to them based on the prophecy of the Old Testament, and these people could go back to those Old Testament prophecies and they could look them up for themselves. And I think Paul was quite glad. And I will be quite, quite glad. If you'll go back, you can download these slides. They're available. And look up all these references that I've given you. Read them in their context. Read them in their fullness. 
and find out whether these things are so or not. Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and there are they which testify of me. He didn't say casually read. Search. Search as for hid treasure. In 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And it's interesting that the word study here is from a Greek word, spudazo, and it means actually to make haste, to give diligence. It's also translated, do thy diligence, be diligent, give diligence, endeavor, endeavoring, labor, as in Hebrews 4.11, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. The word that we translate labor here is translated study in 2 Timothy 2.15. But based on the context of that verse, they said, okay, that means give diligence to rightly dividing the word truth. That means to study it. But give diligence to your Bible study. Don't just accept something because someone says. In Psalms 119 and verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, but too many people. It's the words of Benny Hinn or Joel Steen or Doug Batchelor or even Neil Wilson or Ted Wilson. We can trust the Bible. The Bible says in Isaiah 40, verse 8, that the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand for what? Forever. Amen. Paul told Timothy, preach the Sunday newspaper to the people. Preach CNN, get some from Fox News, let them know what's going on. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, he says, preach what? Preach the word. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Friends, you've got to know the word of God because you can't trust your eyes. You can't trust your eyes. And you can't trust what the preachers say. You trust what the word of God teaches you. In Psalms 119 and verse 11, he says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart. Why? What would be the result of that? That I might not sin against thee. And friends, sin is the issue, isn't it? Sin is the issue that we're up against. The whole thing can be sum up, sum, summarized up into sin and salvation. And sin is the breaking of God's law in one fashion or another. And, uh, and that's what we want to avoid having sin. But the preacher, did he really say that? How many of you remember Jim Jones? Any of y'all remember Jim Jones? If you go live back in 1974, you would. Jim Jones actually was a very popular preacher in America at one time, um, doing seemingly good work. He came out of a Pentecostal background, started his own church, and started doing a lot of community work, uh, one of the first major integrated churches in America, fully integrated. Even received, e even, even received a, a, a commendation from Rosalind Carter for his work. But he became somewhat disillusioned with America and our capitalistic system, and he believed that the church should be living in a socialistic kind of state, sort of like the early church, you know, everybody sharing everything equal. And so he gathered a, a large flock of people and they went to Guyana to, to form a, a, a community there. It was, became known as Jonestown. And so word started to come back that maybe everything wasn't so nice there after all. And, and there were people maybe even being held there against their will. And uh, this word got back to the United States, and so Congressman Leo Ryan and some others went down to Guyana to visit to see what was really happening. And before they could leave, they were murdered by these people, by the henchmen of Jones, because they saw things, they were going to report things, they didn't want to report it back. And Jones had an apocalyptic kind of mentality, and he said, the time is up, and we're all going to kill ourselves. And so they took some flavor aid and they mixed some potassium cyanide in it. And the ones who wouldn't voluntarily drink it were forced to drink it at gunpoint. And 909 died because the preacher said so. 909 people died because the preacher said so. Let that sink into your thoughts for just a little bit. You think that's really bad, don't you? You think that's terrible, don't you? I do. 
But friends, it's not nearly as bad as the thousands and millions who are going to have eternal loss. Not just physical loss, but eternal loss, because the preacher said so. And they're not going to tell them to drink the cyanide, but they're going to give them something worse. They're going to indoctrinate them with the doctrines of devils and demons, and they will be lost eternally because they didn't know what the scripture said for themselves. You can't trust that I know the scripture for, for you. And even if I know it's so great for myself, it doesn't help you. You have to study for yourself to know what the scripture says. You have to study. You have to search. This is not a casual perusal. This is not just a, a simple reading of a devotional every morning and every evening and thinking that of itself is going to make you a Christian and get you by. It's not going to happen. This book and this book alone is what you need to get you through the last days. Having this book into your life, as James calls it, the engrafted word, right? Becomes a part of us, a part of you. But, you know, we're all so busy. We've got this to do and we've got that to do. And we're all just so busy. But I'm going to tell you, if you're going to be too busy for this, you're going to be too busy for eternal life. You'll be too busy for eternal life. May God help you, friends, to take this book and to treasure it and to study it and to know for yourself, especially for the coming events, to be safeguarded against spiritualism, to understand the truth of the Lord's Day, the true Lord's Day. And to understand that keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus is what's going to constitute the true church that you need to be a part of. May God bless you lots and lots and lots.